Thank you all for attending. Um, last year, this presentation was all mine based on my own research. Over the last year, various people reached out to me and said, hey, what you're doing is interesting. Can I work with you on that? And I really want to encourage more people to do this. so. This is a very large subject. No one person can encompass, uh, en encapsulate it all. Uh, Greg Dominguez was particularly helpful in putting together parts of this presentation. Cindy also helped out with a lot with the mobile stuff and getting information extracted for me that I had no clue how to go about. Uh, some other people also contributed. They wanted their names left off. Again, it's a community effort. I'm up here as a subject matter expert, but I'm not here telling you things that you don't already know or you can't find out on your own. Most of the information that's extracted from UAVs and the systems around them are extracted and analyzed using tools or processes and procedures that we already know. I used to close with this slide. That was when I had a 50 minute presentation. And I have to encapsulate this whole thing down 25 minutes and so I flipped it around. My end goal on any investigation is to tie as many different artifacts together using forensic artifacts and evidence to say here is what happened, here's all the evidence to support my conclusion. So as many data points as possible, bring them all together. And it's not the black button, it's the up arrow. There we go. So the UAV is paired with the controller. The UAV is also paired with the ground control station, which is usually a mobile device. All of these things collect data that may be tagged in some form or another. Something is used to plan the mission. The sensor data needs to be analyzed and then produced to the client or to yourself, which means there has to be unique IDs in here somewhere that tie all this information together, or otherwise the ecosystem falls apart. According to DGI, manufacturer of one of the most popular UAVs or drones out there, there's no single serial number that ties all these things together. This, their explanations here, it seems a little bit vague to me. And we went off and proved that they're not quite right. The Phantom 2 is the picture on the left. Um, they used to put the IDs on the outside. It's very easy. They had a MAC address on there, and they also had a unique serial number. They've, over the last couple of years, they've actually made it more difficult to do some forensic analysis. Some of these things are now obfuscated. On the new Phantom 3s and the Phantom 4s, you see a lot of stuff on the right. And there are all these QR codes and these random numbers, and they go to different things, and some of them are very difficult to figure out what they go to. But they've also provided us with a wealth of information that was not available earlier that make our analysis much easier, and we'll get into that. There's a UAV workflow that I, as a UAV operator, go through every single mission. And some of it's formal, and some of it I just do it because it's the way I do things. There's a mission planning step. There's an approval step that may just be you checking in with yourself to say, it's okay, I wanna go fly this. Then you go fly it. Then you do the analysis on it. And the analysis may just be publishing those pictures to Facebook, but you're still doing that step. Oh, sorry, that's the delivery. The analysis is saying, do I wanna deliver this stuff to Facebook? and then you deliver it to Facebook. Each one, of, each one of those steps produces or potentially produces evidence or artifacts that are useful to you. All the, that UAV ecosystem also has a lot of data flows that are also producing a lot of artifacts that may be useful to you. The UAV is getting GPS signals from the environment. It's uplinking data to the cloud. It may be sending back telemetry to the corporate network or to DGI, which is not your corporate network, but is a corporate network. The ground control station is talking to the UAV. The payload operator may be talking to the UAV. The pilot in command may be talking with the flight controller via another mechanism. All these data flows are a potential source of information. I use the Phantom 3 as an example UAV. There's not a lot of good market data, but it's safe to say that DGI products represent probably between 30% and 60% of the US commercial, uh, sorry, consumer market. These are the physical artifacts that are available and that if you are examining a UAV, you should go look for these other artifacts if you do not already have them. 
we know that we need the UAV. The UAV's got a bunch of processors and memory and other things on board inside the shell, but it also is going to have a sensor, which is most often a camera of some sort. There is a flight, there's a, re a remote control unit that is, that is a necessity for operating these things. This is the manual control. Analyzing these things is very tough, but you still want to collect it. There are batteries. On the DGI products, those batteries actually have a controller on them, and they've got a serial number. And you can examine them to find out how much life is left on them, how many times they've been charged. The biggest source of information available is the ground control station. This is the mobile device. It's really sexy to go analyze all the embedded components and do JTAG analysis and all this other stuff on the UAV. I love doing that stuff. The answer is 80% of the information that you'll be looking for is going to be on that ground control station, and you already know how to analyze that with open source tools, mobile forensics that are taught by SANS, Celebrite, all these other things. There's also sort of the back end systems, which in my case is my laptop, used for image processing, uploading firmware, and things like that. Altogether, those are all the forensic artifacts that you want to collect. Those, those physical artifacts produce a we large wealth of digital artifacts. This slide starts talking about them. You can, I'll make the slides available. You're welcome to go into it. But it's all the standard stuff that we're looking at. Mobile operating systems, all the artifacts, traditional operating systems, EEPROMs, firmware, all that sort of stuff. JTAG analysis. Last year, I was like, OK, there's got to be a wealth of information on these chips. The answer is there probably is a lot of information on these chips. I don't know how to get to them yet. So if, that, if any people are interested in doing JTAG and things like that, please reach out to me. I'll be happy to make example UAVs available or whatever else. We need to chase down this sort of stuff. There are, in, in the process of doing the JTAG analysis, we did tear on a DJI Phantom 3 apart. Some of these chips are masked off, making it a little more difficult. The GPS you can open up and get to, but the biggest find was on the casing on one of these chips, there's a serial number. We didn't know the value of that serial number until we were looking at other artifacts and saying, okay, I got this string here, I don't know what it is, where else does it appear? And there's no way to go do a search through your artifacts using grep or anything looking for that image. We had to pay attention to all these artifacts and keep them in our head. Phantom 2 had, very, had no logs available. Other flight controllers produced logs. The Phantom 3 now has extensive data logging capability. People want to know what their UAVs are doing. They want to know how they crashed. This is your biggest source of information. All, most of the flight controllers have some sort of data logging capability. Some is built in, such as on the Pixhawk. Others, like the DJI NASA, you got to get an off-board data uh, logger. Most of the ground control stations have their own data logging. Bear that in mind. And the data logger is essentially your black box. The Phantom 3 has a single file that's called fly question, uh, in a series of numbers dot dat. The ground control station creates its own log file, and these are rotated a la normal logs. It's stored on the Phantom 3 on a 4 gigs SD card. It'll rotate those files out. To, you can get at that card via booting up the UAV in a special mode and just connecting to it via USB cable. Forensic, it, putting a write block on there kind of interferes with the process, so the best solution is to pull the card off. That's the card. It's a, the locking mechanism's epoxied on, so you've got to go open up the shell, clear that epoxy off, pull the lock out, and then you can pull the card out. It's really not rocket science. Um, I can do it, you can do it. Though in those logs, you see this string, or a string like that. That was our first clue, MCID, master controller, main controller, whatever, ID. That ID, it's about five lines from the bottom of that data file. It matches up with that string that's on top of the controller. Inside the DGI Go app, the DGI's own application for controlling these things, in this particular file, that string shows up. Most of the mobile device applications, that string shows up. It's on the main board. It may be in the data stream. There's a 
commercial, it's not even commercial, it's a, it's a website called DatCon, and if you upload or download their application and run that application over that file, it'll produce a big CSV file, a KML file useful for Google Earth, a log file, and a config text file. That CSV file has an enormous wealth of information in it. It'll tell you about the motors, it'll tell you about the batteries, it'll tell you about all these other artifacts, but it has a wealth of GPS information in there that'll tell you about where the, the aircraft has been, where it got launched from, and things like that. This is your key source of data. The event log, it's like a Windows event log. It has got the boot sequence in there, It'll show some of the other things that are attached to it, a la USB devices, primarily in case a battery barcode in this case. It also has the first home point and lat long point. You can now say, okay, where was this thing most often launched or turned on? The configuration file, it's like any other configuration file. In the boot and initialization information, it's got that MCID in it again. It's got that ability to say this log file goes with this airframe. Let's say that you have no UAV. You've got no mobile device. All you've got is a bunch of images that you found on the guy's computer, or the SD card. And it's not the SD card on the main board, it's the SD card that goes with the sensor. What can you do with it? Most of these UAVs, except for the race, racing UAVs, first person view ones, are out there to collect data of some fort. They got a sensor on them, they're gonna be collecting methane gas emissions, they're gonna be collecting uh, NDVI imagery, they're gonna be collecting normal imagery. That imagery is really only terribly useful if somebody knows where that imagery or that data came from in real space. So it's gonna have GPS coordinates. And it's gonna have time information because they wanna know that this methane data came out three weeks ago or three years ago. So just knowing what type of sensor data you've got will tell you a lot about the intended mission of this aircraft. The most common sensors out there are optical. It's usually a uh, GoPro, it's usually the sensor, or the optical camera on a DJI or something like that. The artifacts that these produce that are of interest to you are the image itself. It's got a picture of the nuclear facility near your house. Should it be there? Probably not. So the, just the image itself tells you something but the XF data. And it's easy to collect, you just pull it out of the camera. Does anybody here not, not know how to at least look at XF data from an image? You can do it on a Mac, you can do it on Windows, there's XF tool, it's easy to get to. And it tells you an awful lot of information. It tells you where the image came from. It tells you the camera model name, which goes back in this case to a DGI product. It tells you the date and time it was created. It used to be on the Phantom 2 that it only told you the GPS latitude and longitude. And if you're trying to prove that somebody was exceeding a threshold out, going too high or too low, it wasn't terribly useful. They now put in GPS altitude as well. So now we have that information. Using that NXIF data and a Python script, you can easily go plot this stuff. So you can start saying, okay, where were all these pictures taken? and they, now what order they were taken in, you now can generate just from the images, the flight path, what was taken, when it was taken. All this information is really kind of interesting, but until you make it available to others, it's only interesting to you. You can post all this stuff, you can post process it and then upload that result but a lot of these consumer drones are now designed to automatically make the information available. So they are able to directly interact with YouTube, Facebook, and other social media sites. All of the commercial stuff has a cloud component also. Drone Deploy, which is one of the tools I use for doing surveying and mapping like that, uploads all the flight logs to Drone Deploy, uploads all the imagery, does post-processing on it, and gives me back a digital elevation model of the whole thing. You need to go see what applications they're using and go talk to the vendors about getting that data back from them. Another wealth of data. Every one of these apps I've used, I just fire up the drone, I fire up the app, not everyone, almost all of them, and away I go. Where are those credentials stored? Probably not on the drone, most likely on the mobile device. 
we're back to that mobile device. There's a wealth of information. Ground control station is the mobile device. The vast majority of consumer UAVs use an Android or iOS device and have a custom app. The vendors provide an app, but there are a lot of third-party applications that are also used. Even the higher-end commercial devices are actually one, running on a custom Windows or sometimes iOS tablet. We know how to analyze those. What we're looking for is planning information. Did this person have the intent to go fly where we found this thing? Flight telemetry data. Did this thing, where did this thing fly and what was it doing when it was flying through this space? We are looking for plans, we're look, looking where it connects to, and we're, we're trying to keep in mind that these are both vendor applications, which they at least have some sense of securing these things, and a lot of other people writing applications who have a lot less interest in securing what's going on. We're looking for default settings. How did the person configure this UAV? We're looking for launch points and dates. Where have they been flying? Have they been flying around this nuclear facility a lot? Where are they testing this thing at home a lot? We're looking for the owner name and account. We've got this data, who owns it? So the DGI flight app, um, they've changed the name of the application. There are a couple different versions of it. It records a lot of the data from the UAV. It's a subset of that data that's in that log that we were talking about. So you can now correlate between the two. It can contain thumbnail images and video, and it contains that MCID number. You can parse it using the tools that we're familiar with. There's the header, there's the end of file. You can now start pulling out all the JPEG files from that. And there's another online parser for this. So if you don't want to go analyze it by yourself, you can upload it, and this is what you get. You get a lot of information about the aircraft. You get the flight path. You get the name of the airplane. You get a bunch of other data. The person's address may, not, may even be in the details section. So this is my flight path. This is imagery from it. It's all available from that mobile device. So now I don't have the images. You know, they're up in the cloud somewhere, I haven't seen them. But now I've got some images to go look for in the cloud. I don't have the UAV, but I have the UAV's name. So if I ever find something, I can now tie it back. That's all available. We're working on taking some of these cloud-based services and making a standalone Python script for doing this sort of stuff so you don't have to upload your data to the cloud. It's a work in progress. These are three different applications I use for flying UAVs. One's drone deploy, which I mentioned, one's PIX4D, which is image processing service, and one's a DGI application. Each one of these has, as an example, some pieces of information. So that's my, one of my accounts I use for drone deploy. Um, on the DGI pilot, it has my home location as the key aircraft location. You can go find my house with it. It's also got Facebook interaction, inter integration. PIX4D, it, has, it records where waypoints were created. Again, showing intent, showing where this one thing may have been. It's got another account that I use. It's got timestamps. Every single one of these applications records very interesting data. We haven't found it all. If you were in the previous uh, presentation about SQL databases, the vast majority is either an SQL database or an AP list. We know how to work with these. So to tie this back to all my main primary goal is to tie all these things together. I want to be able to say all of these artifacts are related or they're not related. If somebody comes up and says, hey, I, these images show that this person was behaving illegally and they own the UAV, and I can't tie all those bits and pieces together, I'll say, yeah, the images show X, but you haven't tied it to the UAV, go back and try again. The P list has that more information about uh, Facebook. The statistics DB is the file that we're most interested in. There are four device types, three of which I know what they are. One's the airframe, one's the battery, one's the camera. There's a device type zero, which I haven't figured out what it is yet. If you look at this, we have two device type twos, that's both of the batteries I ever had on this airframe. 
we have a device type one right there. Sorry, I'm out of trap. Sorry. One is the camera. And then most importantly, sorry, one is the airframe. The one I'm missing up on here is a camera. That airframe is that magic number we've been looking for. That's the same thing that we've seen in the applications. That's the same thing that we saw on the motherboard. I believe, and I haven't gotten this far yet, in all those data flows that we were looking at, that ID will show up there as well. DGI has 30 to 60% of the market. Uh, 3DR has another chunk of it. There are a bunch of other vendors out there. One of the more common flight controllers that's not DGI is called the Pixhawk. Um, the standard ground control station for it runs on Windows. It's called Mission Planner. It has been around for probably eight, nine, maybe even 10 years. It's the hobbyist tool for learning how to build up their own UAVs. And so they log everything because they're using this for crash analysis, for tuning motors, for tuning batteries, all of that. Simply by downloading the data off of the Pixhawk flight controller on my UAV and putting it in a mission planner, I could produce this map in two minutes' time. That's right there. I'm not going to say it's forensically sound, but at least it's standalone. It's not sitting up in the cloud. It shows where I flew, what I flew over, altitudes, all of that. That's just the graphical representation. All the raw data is sitting underneath that. Does anybody here a pilot? Oh, wow, first time they're not. Um, this is me landing a fixed wing UAV. What it's showing is the pitch angle. And so I'm trying to land it, so my pitch is fluctuating all over as I bring the nose up and down. I finally get it on my landing path. Everything's cool. We're just coming in, we're coming in. If that's my pitch angle, what does that big downward spike mean happen to my nose on my aircraft? It hit a chain link fence. So smacked in the chain link fence and pitched down, hit the ground, pitched back up to level. All that data is available for the Pixhawk flight controller. There's an enormous amount of analysis tools available for you already. So some closing thoughts. The DJI Phantom 2 had a Wi-Fi access point right there on the controller. You fired up your phone, you fired up the access point, you fired up the UAV, the, U the access point said, I'm a DJI Phantom and had a string of numbers right after that. Both the other devices connected that access point and now you can connect it to them. You can also log into that access point remotely via SSH and use all your standard Linux tools to dump out whatever you want to do. Unfortunately, they moved away from that. This, the, in the interest of getting more bandwidth and also in the interest of getting more security, the vendors are going to get better and better at securing that data link, and we're already seeing it. And some of this stuff is moving to LTE, 4G, cellular connections. There's a little bit of lag, but it's not fatal. So these are also data links that we are accustomed to analyzing. We know how the phones interact with them. We know how to go file subpoenas against the data service providers. We know how to work with this sort of stuff. There are a lot of vendors, a lot of variety, a lot of embedded systems. When I did this presentation a year ago and was looking at the Phantom 2, I had to look at three different versions of Linux. I had to look at either iOS or Android, OS X or Windows, six different file systems to go looking for the data. I was looking at Sear2Net, which takes serial I.O. and turns it into a network flow, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, XF data, GPS. What I'm getting at, before I get hyperactive here, is that there's no single UAV forensic analysis tool out there. And if somebody tries to say, hey, we've got one, it's unlikely to be true. To properly analyze all this requires a group of people that understand these different components and put it together in a whole story. There's a cybersecurity aspect to this as well. The proper name for a drone is a UAS, or SUAS, Unmanned Aerial System. It's a very similar in this regard to the Internet of Things. You've got processors, memory, and a bunch of sensors hooked up via um, either direct or network I.O. paths communicating with the cloud running on a lot of different devices. This is just an instance of the IoT. Law and policy, 
remember that it's just a vehicle. It's a pickup truck flying these sensors around. If you're going to write a law about UAVs and you want to actually protect people's privacy, don't write it to say, hey, UAVs cannot fly over the backyard because I'm going to go fly a kite over your backyard. Write your policy about what's being detected and what your concerns are about that detection. And that's it. Do you have any?